Welcome to Life Worship Center. We are a Pentecostal church that is passionate about Jesus. Now, as a church, our mission is to always be reaching. We want to be reaching up to find intimacy with God. We want to be reaching in to find unity with God's people. And we want to be reaching out for the world that God loves. Now, I pray that you'll join right in with us from home today and worship the Lord with us in spirit and in truth. I'm so excited to bring to you an encouraging and an uplifting message from the Word of God today. Thanks again for joining us, and let's go live at Life Worship Center. We have a, just a, we have a special guest with us today, some dear friends of mine. If you'll... Donald, if you'll hit those lights back for me when Pastor Brian helps me out up here. I appreciate that. Can I get, uh, Jason, can you enjoy both stands just for a moment? Let me talk about you just for a minute. <laughs> for those of you that don't know, this is Jason and Joy Byler. Now, how many years have you guys been helping with the, or lead, not helping, how many years have you guys been leading the kids camp and the Emerge? <laughs> a long time. 20 years, 20 years, that's, wow. You started when you were four, five, six, somewhere in there. <laughs> so when you guys send your kids down to Shaco Springs and our, the kids camp or down to the beach for the Emerge, these are the two right here that are loving on your kids, sowing into their lives, preaching God's word. I've seen them in action. They just, they love your kids. They, they love our students. and. We're so, yeah, let's give them a hand for that. We're just so grateful for their passionate hearts. They pastor a church called Life Change Church in Greenville, Alabama. Jason Byler was recently elected as our assistant superintendent. I have the privilege and honor of serving on the board with him for our Alpha Conference and just a wonderful family. Would you make them welcome? Jason, we honor you, brother. Come on up and share the word with us today. Praise the Lord. God is good, isn't he? Amen. Hallelujah. So um, thankful and honored and excited to be with you this morning. Um, I'd like to, before I get going, just take a moment to um, just bless your pastors, your wonderful pastor family, uh, which I don't, I'm sure you know, don't know if you know, but I'm sure you do, uh, that you are blessed uh, with a powerful man and woman of God uh, leading this church. Amen. And um, I'm honored, uh, brother, that you'd let me share your pulpit and in your church uh, this morning. Um, this is something that needs to take place uh, in the church uh, today, and um, I'd just like for you, if you would, to just stand and just, just point your hands to him. You guys can sit. You sit. You, yeah, you guys sit. We'll stand. Just, uh, just raise out a hand uh, to him there, and I'm just going to bless him, and you can just agree uh, with me. Father, we bless this powerful couple in Jesus' name. We bless them with every spiritual blessing in the high places, Lord. We surround them with your, we bless them with, with your favor round about them as a shield. Uh, we bless them with your protection uh, spread over them. Uh, we say they are blessed and highly favored. That as they delight themselves in you, you will give them the desires of their heart. That all of your promises in Christ are yes, and they are yes for this powerful couple in Jesus' name. That you, Lord, are powerfully uh, with them. We bless them in Jesus' name. Uh, we bless them and, and ask that your faith 
face shine upon them and that you pour out your rich, abundant blessing on their hearts and that you bring to them their dreams and all of their bigness. And we pray in Jesus' name that you would do exceedingly, abundantly above, immeasurably more than that according to your power that is at work within them. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's, um, let's start in Ephesians. If you have your Bibles or your phones or your iPads, we'll roll over to Ephesians chapter 3. And I'd like to share with you um, something that is it's pretty simple um, to understand, easy, easy to grasp it, easy to understand. Uh, not so easy to do. So simple, understand, pretty difficult uh, to do, something that we all uh, struggle with. But it is, let me just tell you, if we will get this and we will begin to apply this to our lives, it's powerful, powerful and, and needed uh, in the church. So in Ephesians, um, starting, at, starting at Ephesians 3, we'll go there and then I'd like to go to, to Malachi uh, chapter 3 uh, as well, and then we'll, then we'll roll on from there as well. I'm, I am going to go to Malachi chapter 3, the, the great tithing passage of Scripture, but I'm not really going to talk about tithing, okay? So we're, we'll go there, but we'll look for something else, because in Ephesians uh, and in Malachi, if, if you're careful and you look, you can begin to, st- to discover uh, some powerful truths about God. There's some there's some revelation. God says some things about who He is and about Himself uh, that if we look, uh, we can see it and we can begin to know God for who He really is. We can begin to understand some things about God. You know, I, I think it was A.W. Tozer that said, that said, the most important thing about us is what we think about God. That when we have a thought about God and about who He is, that that is the most important thing about us. And the more I meditate on that and, and think about it, the more I believe that that is true. Because when I, when I sit down and I begin to think about God and my thoughts about God are accurate and they are true and they are right and they are just, then, then I find that I, I am led by my thinking that is right and true in the right direction. But when my thinking and my thoughts about God are false, and you know life kind of takes place and happens and I begin to think about God, what isn't really God, and I have thoughts about God that aren't accurate, that aren't true, that they're false, then those, my thinking, you know that, right? Our, our, our thinking, our speaking, and, and, our, and, our, and, and what's in our hearts is what comes out of our mouth. Th- these have a powerful impact on the direction that we go in our lives. So when my thinking's messed up, when it's false, when it's wrong, then I find myself headed in a wrong direction. So, so we need to be... Uh, studying the scriptures and allowing God to speak to us of who he is. And here in Ephesians 3 and in Malachi, and I'm going to do a little bit in Ephesians 4 as well, we discover some things about God. I'm going to start verse 14, Ephesians 3, verse 14. I'm going to read pretty fast because I want to get, get down here towards the end of it, but all this is so good, I just had to read it. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. You know that scripture? You heard that one? To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Let me point out something about God that we probably know. We don't, we don't grasp it totally, but, but we, we can, and uh, hopefully we are growing in it, is that God loves, that God is love. And that God loves His people with a love that surpasses knowledge. It's something that can't even be grasped. 
It's one of those things that he speaks about, like in Jeremiah 33, where he said to Jeremiah, I will show you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. That's how God's love is. It is great and unsearchable. We can't even know it. God can begin to reveal it to us, and he needs to, and he is. That great, unsearchable, wide, long, high, deep love of God is so great, so a part of Him, that, that God's love is one of the revelations and knowledges that we need to have of God. We need to remember and know that God loves and that God loves His people. Amen. Amen. Now verse 20, a pretty popular passage of Scripture. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, or King James, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think according to his power that is at work within us. Verse 21, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Did you catch the to Him be glory part? Now, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to His power that is at work in us, His power at work in us, and all of that leads to Him being glorified. Now, if, we, if we're looking close, we understand something else about God here. That not only does God love his people, and his God love, but God has a passion for his glory. God has a, has, a, has a burning passion for glory. And if you begin to study the scriptures, you will see time and time again that two of God's great desires and motivations are coming out of his love for his people and his passion for his glory. Something that we need to understand. God loves His people, and God is passionate about His glory. Now, not only does God love, and God is passionate about His glory, but God is able. God is able to do immeasurably more than all that you ask or can even think. I want you to remember that this morning. That that. In this church, this house, the greatest prayers that you can pray and that Pastor Jonathan prays, the greatest vision, dream, imagination that you have or he has, God is able to do more. But not just more. You catch it, right? Immeasurably more. Exceedingly, abundantly, above his greatest dream, His greatest prayer for this house, for this church. God is able to do more. Don't you want to see Him do more? Don't you want to begin to see the exceedingly, abundantly, above? Amen. Not, now, not only is God able to do that for this house and desires to do that for this house, but Brooklyn, can you stand up? You cool with that? You okay? Excellent. God is able to do this for Brooklyn as well and desires to and wants to to do exceedingly abundantly above immeasurably more than all that she could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in his life and what God is going to do for her that he wants to do that is beyond what anything that she could imagine or ask for or dream and what God wants to do for this house that is beyond anything he could ask for that we could ask for or imagine or dream are both going to work about his two desires they're going to they're going to reveal and and pour out his love on his people and they're going to bring him glory and honor thank you Walk back up the stairs. Hallelujah. Now, rolling down here into chapter 4, verse 1. Just let me remind you of, of something. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Let me tell you now, there is a call of God on your life. 
There is a unique call of God on each and every one of your lives. And it is bigger than your eye can see, than your ear can hear, than your mind can conceive. It is so big, Romans says we can't even pray it in our own ability, that the Spirit has to help us and pray through us with groans that words cannot express the will of God for our lives. There is a call of God on your life. And and Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here in Ephesians, urges us to live worthy of the calling that we have received. I want to tell you about I want to tell you about part of that calling uh, this morning that is on your life and, um, and want to urge you, as Paul did, to step up and begin to live worthy of the calling that you have received. Not only is there this calling on your life, but there's a calling on this church. It is, it is unique, it is beautiful, it is special. God has a calling on this church and God is able to bring it about. And it will be exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or imagine or think. Now, let's go over to Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. And we'll learn some more things about this and about, and about who, God, who God is. Malachi chapter 3. I'd, I'd love to read all of it, but let's start here at verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. See, you see it? See God talking about Himself. God does, if, if you want to just, on your own time, go read Malachi and just look at, at what God says about Himself and how He reveals things uh, about Himself. And here He says, I'm, I am the Lord and I do not change. And he says, therefore, you are not destroyed. Aren't you glad God doesn't change? Aren't you glad His yes is yes? Aren't you glad all His promises are yes in Christ Jesus and He's not changing His mind? Aren't you glad that He is not a man that He should lie or the Son of Man that He should change His mind? Have he not, hath He not spoken it? Will He not do it? God doesn't change. He is the same as Hebrews says, yesterday, today, and forevermore. I'm thankful that God doesn't change, that even though I am unfaithful, He is not unfaithful, and that I can put all of my hope and trust in Him and lean on Him, and, and with, with not my understanding, but faith and trust in Him, and He is, I'm thankful that He is a secure, firm foundation. Thankful that the Lord does not change. Continuing here, verse 7. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. You see, God God just, if you're looking, just revealing things about Himself. He's saying that there's, there's, a, there's a, a distance between us. There's a separation. He says, I don't like that. I don't want that. I want you to return to me. He said, I will return to you because I desire love and relationship and communion with my people. But you ask, continuing here in verse 7, how are we to return? It's God having this conversation uh, with us and saying what we would say and then answering uh, the questions. Verse 8, will a man rob God, yet you rob me? Now, I know that nobody likes this passage of Scripture, so we're not going to really talk about the robbing God thing, all right? And, and then there's going to talk about a curse. We're not going to talk about that uh, either. Um, you can get time with your pastor, and he can explain you know, all that stuff to you. Uh, I want to look at something else. You, you, will a man rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you in tithes and offerings? You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. So God says to bring the tithe, we know that's you know, 10%, bring the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now, I don't want to talk about it, but I say, I say bring the tithe into the storehouse that there might be food in God's house. So God says, God says to bring the tithe where? into the storehouse, and then he says what? That there might be food in whose house? His house, my house. So God identifies 
what the storehouse is. The storehouse is his house. And God identifies why he wants there to be tithes and offerings that are brought into the storehouse. Did you see it? He wants there to be tithes and offerings brought into the storehouse that there might be food in his house. So in God's house, he desires that there would be food in his house. He desires that there would be abundance in his house. He desires that his house would be blessed with more than enough. That his house would be blessed with a fullness of food. Continuing. Test me in this, says the Lord. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. You guys know this? And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. You see, now God says, now God says, I desire that in my house there be food, that there be blessing, that there be a fullness. And then God says, to those who will bring their tithe and their offering, he said, you go ahead and test my word. You test my faithfulness. You test what I say. I've already said that I don't change. Go ahead and test it and see if I will not bless you. But it's not just bless you, right? Because that's just too easy for God. It's very much like Ephesians 3.20. Exceedingly, abundantly, above, immeasurably, more. God says, see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. You like that? I like this. We don't like that rob and, and curse part, but we sure like this. Throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you that you will not have room enough to contain it. That's how God blesses. He can pour out so much blessing on us that we don't have room enough to be able to even handle it or to contain it. So we see something about God here, okay? We see Hopefully you see this. If, if not, we can look at some others. That, that God has a passion for His house. And that God is a blesser. That God is a giver. That God wants to bless. And that He is able to bless this house and each and every one of you with more than you can even handle. God has a passion for His house. And God is a blesser. You know God's got a passion for his house. You see it here, don't you? He says, I desire that there be food in my house. You remember one of the things that they identified and remembered about Jesus? That Jesus came in. You remember he made the whip and he came into the temple and he drove out the money changers and, and all the crooked things that were going on in his father's house. And he said, this is my father's house is a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of thieves. And they, they remembered when Jesus did that, that it would be said of him that zeal for his father's house consumes him. Jesus has a passion and a zeal for God's house because God has a passion and a zeal for his house. If, if you don't believe me, go and read Ezra or go and read Haggai and you can see God's passion for his house and God's desire that his house be full of food, that his house be full of abundance. God desires that his house be a blessed place. God desires that his house be so blessed, so full, that there is abundance of food in his house. And God desires to bless the individual who blesses his house. Now, let me say that slow. God desires for his house to be blessed. God desires to bless the person who blesses his house. So there is an abundance in his house and there is an overflow on the individual. The overflow on the individual is coming from God's blessing. The abundance in the house is coming from the individual blessed by God. So we have a, we have an, a relationship in this with God, with what He is up to, and what He's doing. I don't know why God has done this this way. He's God. I'm not. 
His wisdom and understanding no one can fathom. If he's done it this way, I just feel like it's right. I'm just going to trust him. God has given us a relationship. He has called us to be a part of what he is up to and what he is doing. The building of his church. So God desires blessing in his house. He calls us to do that. And then he takes responsibility for himself to bless us when we bless his house. Now why would God want his house to be blessed? Why would God want his house to be full of food? He would want it to be full of food because his desire for his house is to bless. So that his house is not only blessed, but that it is a blessing. So that when the hungry come, we have something to feed them. So that when the hurting and the needy need, we have something to bless them with so that the house of God would be a blessing that the people of God would be blessed. Now, let me keep on reading. He says, that I'll throw open the floodgates of heaven, and then, but he keeps on going. In verse 11, he says, I will prevent the pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. So he says, even... Not only pouring out blessing upon us, but it's going to bless all that we put our hands to. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. So that, so that when we as individuals begin to bless the house of God, God pours out his blessing on us. We bless God's house, and there is abundance and fullness in both places, then it will be seen that we are blessed. Then the world will see the blessing of God on His house. And they will say, they are blessed. And that is saying, God is there. God is present. God is moving. God is blessing. God is at work. So God, when, when His people and His house are blessed, God is exalted and glorified because of the blessing that is on the house of God. The world and the nations will see God's blessing and they will glorify Him and exalt Him. And God, who has a love for His people, will see His people blessed with all that they need, with more than they can handle. God loves His people. So God's love and His glory are both, both of these desires are being fulfilled by His house. Now, in the Old Covenant, His house was a tent or a temple that was made by human hands out of, out of wood and, and stone and precious metals. But now, in the New Covenant, things have changed. God has not changed. Because God does not change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But the covenant has changed, and God's house has changed. Now because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because of His death on the cross, His suffering, His bloodshed, His death, His resurrection, has established a new covenant of which He is the mediator. A covenant that is not by the blood of bulls and goats, that is not by a sacrificial lamb that someone brought. Jesus came and shed His blood to make this covenant. He came as the lamb and suffered and died and established a new covenant of which there is a new house of God. It is us. We are now His house. We, His people, are not only the body of Christ, this is clear and easy to prove in Scripture, but we are a house of God. Ephesians 2 says it. 1 Peter says it. We are living stones that come together to form a building in which God lives by His Spirit. 1 Corinthians uh, talks about that we are the temple uh, of the Holy Spirit. Several times it uh, says this. We are a house of God. This church, us gathered here together, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, a little bit difficult, but 
not only us together, but also individually. We are the house of God. As a, as, as a gathering, we are a building that is the house of God. As an individual, we are a living stone that is also filled with God's presence, that is also a temple of the Holy Spirit. So you are now God's house. We together are now God's house. So as in the old covenant, God had a passion for His house. Now in the new covenant, God has a passion for His house It is His people. It is His church together corporately and Pastor Jonathan individually all by himself. It's different. Not that he needs to abandon the church. Got to come together as a church. But he also is a living stone filled with the presence of God. So as God in the Old Covenant desired abundance, Food in His house, that His house would be a blessing. In the new covenant, God's not changed. The covenant's changed. The house has changed. His desire stays the same. He desires there be food in this house. He desires there be food in this house. He desires there be food in the house that's Brooklyn. He desires that there be abundance. He wants there to be blessing. Now, As I said earlier, this house that is life worship center is the house of God and has a call of God on this place. And there is a blessing in this house. There's a blessing in this house that is a it is a unique, powerful blessing that will be a blessing to everyone that comes in contact, a blessing that needs to be released. There's a, a food in this house, if you will, that is a blessing that needs to be let go, that needs to be released. Not only that, but there is a blessing in Brooklyn that needs to be released, that, that, is, that is abundant and beautiful and needed, a, a gifting, as, as Corinthians and Romans calls it, this wonderful call of God on her life that cannot be held back, that needs to be given and released because God desires for His house to be a place of an abundance of food so that out of that there can be blessing. Now, same thing with Pastor Jonathan and, and April there, that there is a blessing in this couple that needs to come out, a gifting in him, in them that needs to be released that, that is immeasurably more than we can imagine. Look around the room. Just identify someone. Look at your own self. This is true of each and every one of us. There's a blessing in the house of God that God wants to be released, that God wants to come out. Now, as there was relationship in Malachi, there's, there's God calling His people to bless His house, and then He taking responsibility to bless the individual. There is something that takes place in our lives when we begin to bless one another. When we begin to to speak blessing and give blessing and think blessing over one another, there's a release that takes place in our lives. But the opposite is also true, that when we will hold back blessing, it has an effect on God's house so that there's not the food in the house that needs to be there, and then there's not the blessing coming out that needs to take place either. Let me try to, try to prove it. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, Jesus. Jesus comes rolling up back into his, into his own town. Take a drink of water. If y'all got one, you can join me. Now this is Jesus. Jesus comes rolling up into his own town. Now we know he's anointed, right? And we know there is some tremendous blessing inside of Jesus. And everywhere he goes, he just lets it out. And lives are changed and transformed. There, there is, there is a, like after Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the wonderful Sermon on the Mount, the people are kind of, after Jesus preaches, the people are kind of sitting there with their mouths open. 
They're like, we haven't ever heard anything like this before. We've never heard anyone say anything like this before. They were amazed at what he said. Everywhere Jesus went, he was amazing people and blessing people and healing and life change was taking place. Mark 6, verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? See, they're amazed again. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What is this wisdom that has been given him? That he even does miracles. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So here's Jesus, this this anointed, gifted man full of food and blessing comes to his hometown and they know him so well, they, they even recognize the anointing and yet they still take offense at him. And instead of blessing and honoring, they are offended and, and we all know what flows out of offense. It's difficult to bless when you're offended, isn't it? it, it what, what comes out more is, is cursing, doesn't it? And Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. There needs to be a returning of honor to the house of God. You understand that? This man right here is the house of God. If there's a passion in you for the house of God, then this man is to be honored. You see, this church here, the house of God, this place needs to be honored. And the people of God in it need to be honored. You see, Brooklyn right there, right? She's a house of God, so there needs to be honor here. You good, Brooklyn? Yep. Gee, and, if, and if anyone was worthy of honor, it is Jesus. And then verse 5. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. You see here, as as they are offended, and as they dishonor Jesus and who he is, Jesus who has this tremendous blessing within him that needs to be released, that must be released, that changes lives, this tremendous gift that changes lives and is a blessing to all the people of God is boxed up, locked down, not released because instead of blessing, they curse, they don't honor and they are offended. And Jesus there, whether he could or he just, whether he couldn't or he chose to not, Jesus didn't do very many miracles in this place. And not a whole lot of life change took place because there wasn't a blessing poured out on him that released the blessing that was in him. You see, if we will begin to bless one another, what happens is we release in each other the blessing that is in one another. There's a gift in you that each and every one of us need. That the house of God needs. And when others begin to bless that gift that is you and the gift that is in you, that gift is released. And I will say, it is released immeasurably more than we can imagine. Exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to His power that is at work within us. Let me tell you one quick story here and I'll... And, and, um, I'll, and then I'll just end by telling you the call of God on your life. There is a, there is a beautiful picture of this uh, in Scripture, in the book of Ruth. And I'll just, I'll just talk you through it here as you probably are pretty familiar with this book and with, with this story. But there's a, a beautiful scene that, that needs to catch our attention. And we need to have this come back into the house of God, into the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we see this take place in our lives and in this house and in all of our houses, I think we'll begin to see uh, some release of blessing uh, in our lives. Ruth is, um, is 
as you know, a Moabitess and, and there was, there was um, Elimelech and Naomi who lived in Bethlehem. You ever heard of Bethlehem? You almost like hear the angels when you say that, don't you? You know, like Bethlehem. Oh, you just hear that. That's where Jesus was born. It's Bethlehem. It's where David came from. Right? They're in Bethlehem. Interesting. Bethlehem means house of bread. It's a place of abundance and fullness. It's like, it's like Malachi 3. This house of God where He wants there to be food. That's Bethlehem. It is a place of abundance, a place of food. But Elimelech and Naomi are there and they're going to leave and go to Moab because something has taken place in Bethlehem. There's a famine and there's not any food in the house of food. Brothers, this should not be. Sisters, this is not God's desire. So they leave and while they're gone, uh, Naomi and Elimelech's two sons, they marry. One of those daughters is Ruth. You know the story? All of the men in the family die, and Naomi and the, and the two daughter-in-laws are, are devastated. They are in mourning. They feel like God has come against them. All the blessing within them is locked up. They are very much in despair. And they hear from Bethlehem that God has moved, that God has changed that He is blessing once again the little city, little town of Bethlehem, and that that house of food now has an abundance of food. Something shifted while they were gone. Something took place, and if you read Ruth carefully, you uncover it. So Naomi says to her daughter-in-law, she says, let's, I'm going to go home. And they say, all right, let's go. And as they're on their journey going home, uh, Naomi says to them, look, you guys don't go with me. You might as well go home. There's not going to be any husbands coming for me, so just go home to your houses. Find you a new husband. Let God bless you. She says, there's no need for you to share in my bitterness. Ruth, as you know, she's not going anywhere. She says to Naomi, she says, I'm going to go where you go. If you, the only thing that's going to separate us is death. She says, where you live, I'm going to live. Your people are going to be my people. Your God, my God. She's not going anywhere. She says, I'm going to go, Naomi, and I'm going to bless you. And Ruth, the Moabitess, begins a journey of being there with Naomi to bless her. And what's going to happen because of this blessing is it's going to unlock a blessing and a gift in Naomi. You read the end of the story, Naomi's blessing, her gift is going to be released, and she's going to take Ruth and Boaz's baby Obed in her arms, and she's going to care for this baby, and she's going to raise up the grandfather of David, who we know from David comes our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All of this unlocked because Ruth said, you know what, there's something in you. I know God's not done with you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bring out what God's put in you. Now, they go back to Bethlehem, and the people are amazed, and they say, isn't that Naomi? And she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Amara because the Lord is against me. The Almighty's against me. He's made me uh, very bitter. And they returned home. And uh, Ruth chapter 2, I'm going to read this. Ruth chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side uh, from the clan of Elimelech, and a man of standing whose name was Boaz. I hope you've heard this. If not, right here in the book, you can read it all for yourself. It's a short, powerful, good read. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up some leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favor. And Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in the field belonging to Boaz. As it turned out, don't you like that? You see God working all through this in the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arised, arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you! Exclamation point. So Boaz shows up to the harvesters and he says, The Lord be with you! And they called back, The Lord bless you! See that? Isn't that beautiful? 
There's, there's not cursing here. There's not offense here. There's not tension here. Boaz shows up at his field, sees his workers, and he calls out to them one of the greatest promises and blessing in Scripture, says, the Lord be with you. And they don't return with grumbling or talking under their breath or rolling their eyes. They look back at him and they say, and the Lord bless you, Boaz. There is blessing from one to the next and back again. God's people blessing God's people. And it reveals the cultural shift in Bethlehem. I don't know if it came from Boaz, but it seems like it did. This man of God begins to bless and people begin to bless him back and something shifted in Bethlehem and the famine goes away. God pours out his blessing and there is food in the house of food again. Now, Boaz, after he blesses his people and they bless him, that is a picture of the way the house of God should be. We should be blessing one another and returning our blessing on each other. Now, Boaz then sees Ruth out there and he begins this journey of blessing Ruth because he is a man of God. He is, he is kind-hearted, full of character, but he sees a gift in Ruth. He sees a blessing in Ruth that needs to be released. And he, even though she has struggled, even though she has had loss and heartache, he goes on this journey of blessing her. And yeah, she was probably cute too. That probably helped. He's single, she's beautiful. No bless her. But there was something else there too. Because we already saw this man come into his field and cry out to his guys, the Lord be with you. And we know that there's something good about him because they didn't even hesitate, but they write back to Adam exclamation point, and the Lord bless you. And Boaz, on the journey of blessing Ruth, unlocks in Ruth something that is immeasurably more exceedingly abundantly above all that they could ask or ever think. From Boaz and Ruth comes King David. And from King David comes our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whom we have all, according to John and our own personal experience, received one blessing after one blessing after the next after the next poured out upon our lives. Anybody been blessed because of Jesus? Hallelujah. He's changed me, saved me, never be the same again because of Him. You know, I've been delivered just like many of you have been delivered. God reached down and delivered me out of the, one of the hardest things that you could ever be delivered out of. I was a lukewarm pastor's kid. Grown up in this, complacent, knew how to praise, go through the motions, looked like I was on fire for Jesus, and God called me up out of lukewarmness and set a fire and a zeal inside of my heart for His people and His church. If God can deliver you out of that, God can deliver you up out of anything. Hallelujah. Calm him down. Calm him down. Praise you, Jesus. Let's be people who bless and when we bless, we will release a blessing on God's house and there will be food in His house. A blessing that will come out. For this is the call of God on our lives. Did you know that? There's a call of God on your life to bless. Let me read it to you. First Peter. First Peter three. First Peter three eight. This is good scripture right here. Not that there's any bad scripture. There's not. This is good. Finally, don't you love finally? That means I'm about finally done. All of you. Anybody? Anybody not included? Finally, all of you. Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Now, 
I'm about to read something simple, hard. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing because to this you were called. Now, I urge you, live worthy of the calling you have received, which is not complex or difficult, but is hard. Live worthy of the calling you have received and bless, bless, and do not curse. And it, it's a calling that's a little more difficult than what we read in Ruth, isn't it? In Ruth we see blessing coming and blessing returning because blessing came. Right? Boaz shows up on the scene and says, the Lord be with you. And they say, yeah, I like that. And the Lord bless you. That is wonderful and it is beautiful. But God is calling us to bless even when that's not taking place. He's calling us to do something that's hard, that goes against our nature to bless when someone shows up on the scene and doesn't bless you. To bless when someone does you evil. To bless when someone speaks a curse over you. When they come and curse you, you look back and you bless them. And I'm not talking about blessing them out. I'm talking about for real blessing them. I'm talking about in your heart is the attitude of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who taught us this very thing that we are to pray for those who persecute us, that we are to bless and not curse. To this you were called. There's a call of God on your life to bless. Let's bless. And when we bless, look what happens. Because, but with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing that when we bless, God is going to throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessing on you. You want blessing poured out on you? Become a blessing. And when you bless, God's going to pour out blessing on you so that you can bless some more. And as you, as you are blessing the people of God, the house of God, there's going to be blessing in His house. And it's going to release the blessing out of His house so that there will be blessing coming out. And then God will not only be blessing you, but He'll be blessing those that you blessed that are now blessing. So that the blessing just is poured out upon each and every one of us and there is an abundance of food in God's house. It just multiplies on top of each other to where we begin to look and say, man, God is doing exceedingly, abundantly above. He is doing immeasurably more. He is being exalted and glorified. All I did was start speaking blessing over people instead of curses. When we all come together and we bless one another, God is blessed and glorified. Something is released. I wondered what would happen. I mean, there's something in this man. I'm telling you. There's something in this man of God. It is, it is immeasurably more, exceeding abundantly above. If it is held back, it is not all that it could be. And I wonder if we begin to honor and bless what would happen, what would take place. I already know he's a fantastic preacher. I've heard him roll. But what would come out of his mouth. You'd probably all come into Sunday morning and, you'd, and after he's done, you'd be sitting there with your mouth wide open. What? You'd be so full of the food. What if you just began to bless? What if you began to bless? What if you began to bless this couple? And not just them. Each and every one of you are a gift, are a living stone are a blessing just waiting to be released. And when we bless, we do something to unlock a blessing and it is released. 
something inside of Brianna. I'm going to bless her and bless her and bless her and bless her until we begin to see the immeasurably more, the exceedingly abundantly above come out. Hallelujah. What if Jesus come rolling up into his own town and his family looked at him and instead of offended, they blessed and they just poured out blessing on the Son of God. It would probably be one of the most remarkable stories in all of the Gospels what Jesus would have done there in their town. Instead, He walked away, having done very little, and, and amazed at their lack of faith, not their great faith. There's a call of God on your life. It is not to curse. It is to bless you say, but they cursed me. Wonderful opportunity. It's so easy to bless when you're blessed. The high call of God on our life is to bless even when we are cursed and something is released. Let's bow our heads. Hallelujah. I just wonder this, this afternoon now, As Ephesians 4 urges us to live worthy of the calling that we've received. A calling to bless. And hopefully now we see that why that is such a high call of God on our lives. We can just go ahead and play a little music. I wonder if, if we this morning would just respond to this worthy, high calling of God on our lives by just raising our hands and saying, I want to live worthy of the call of God on my life. When I'm, when I'm insulted, I want to bless. When evil's done against me, I want to bless. Hallelujah. Hands going up all over the room. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you're raising your hands up there, it's just a commitment to bless the, to bless the Lord to bless His house, to bless His people, in order to see a blessing released in someone else and on your own life as well. Would you just come up, just come up to the front with me here? And anyone else who would like to join, like I said, maybe I didn't raise my hand, but I want to come up. I want to come up and, and get in on this as well. And I'm not saying in any way that you're not doing this. I'm just saying that we're refreshing this commitment to live worthy of the high call of God on our lives to be a blessing. And we're just going to come forward and just make a declaration that I'm going to bless and not curse. And no matter what is done against me, I'm going to be a Boaz. I'm going to be a Ruth. And I'm going to be a blessing. Now, there are many ways that we can bless. And we need to be asking God. It's the call of God on our lives. It's, it's Ephesians 10. You know, to, to consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. To encourage, to not give up meeting together, but to come together and to encourage and bless one another. It's such a high call of God on our lives because when we do, we release the gift in each other. We release the food, if you will. The blessing that is in the house that is you. When we bless one another. So I would encourage you to to pray blessing over one another. When you go to pray and God gives you names, pray a blessing over one another. I would encourage you to bless with gifts. Boaz did this with Ruth. He began to, he began to feed her at his table and blessed her with protection and blessed her with gifts. Don't shy away from bringing your tithe and your offering. And don't shy away from just bringing to someone who needs it a gift there's something wonderful about a gift given. And I would bless, I would encourage you to bless by speaking encouragement over one another. You just come to each other and encourage each other in the Lord. There's something so powerful about that. And I would encourage you to bless by speaking blessing over one another. And I'd just like us to do that this morning. Reach out and try to lay a hand on someone so that we're all kind of touching each other. We don't have to hold hands, so let's just lay hands on each other here. You guys can do that out there sitting in your seats as well. You can just lay hands 
upon one another. And let's just begin to, to speak blessing over the people that you've got your hand upon. And I'm just going to do some of that right here as well. Hallelujah. I just bless Life Worship Center and say the Lord bless you. The Lord be with you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and give you peace. That the Lord would pour out His mercy and His grace. That He'd give you the desires of your heart. That He would make a way where there seems to be no way. That He would bless you with freedom. That He'd bless you with deliverance. That He'd bless you with joy. That He would bless you with peace. That He would bless you with provision. That there would be abundance that would come to you. That He'd spread His protection over you. That He'd be round about you as the mountains are round about Jerusalem. That the blessing within you would be released and revelation would come of who God is and who you are in Him. And you'd rise up with passion and boldness and courage and begin to do the things that God has called you to do. I bless you with deep, wonderful relationship with the Heavenly Father. I call you to, to come boldly to His throne. The veil's been rent. The price has been paid. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Bless you, Life Church, in Jesus' name. Bless you, Life Worship Center, in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord be with you and bless you. Just bless one another a second. Take a second and bless one another. Hallelujah. It was a privilege to have you as our special guest today. Thank you for joining us at Life Worship Center. Now, our ministry is supported by the generosity of people just like you. Please consider giving today online by clicking on the link of our website, lifewc.org. Thank you for making a difference in the lives of others. And until next time, God bless.